So my name is Colin Luke. Um, I've definitely had the privilege of meeting some of you in the audience today, um, those that I have not met yet. Um, I'm one of the neuromuscular fellows in the clinic, um, and so I hope in future clinics to definitely meet you guys there. So I actually have the, uh, the joy today of speaking a little bit about marijuana and uh, marijuana's use in ALS. Um, specifically, I'm going to review a bit of the evidence out there and uh, hopefully shed some light on um, some of the questions that have popped up in uh, previous clinics. And I think this is an interesting topic because um, I'd have to say there's, there's not a lot of evidence out there, but I think the evidence that we do have out there um, can help inform us a little bit in terms of you know, where it stands in terms of ALS therapy. So marijuana itself, um, you know, the, the plant uh, named Cannabis sativa, it's a flowering plant um, and uh, when you take the leaves, the flowers, the stem, the seeds, uh, and when they're dried, collectively they're referred to as what we call marijuana. The actual plant itself is incredibly complex. Um, you know, it contains over 500 distinct chemical compounds and the interesting thing is I think there's always more and more being added to that because when I compared a paper uh, that uh, talked about marijuana about 10 years ago, they said 400 distinct uh, compounds and a more recent one said 500. So certainly it's a, it's a plant that uh, does have a lot of research going into it, um, but it is a very complex plant on its own. But when it comes down to distilling, you know, what, what is marijuana and why do people take it? You know, the active ingredients uh, in cannabis um, are uh, cannabidiol, so CBD, or uh, your tetrahydrocannabinol, um, which is uh, THC. And collectively, these two are what we refer to as uh, cannabinoids. Um, so I'm going to use the term cannabinoids and marijuana interchangeably through the rest of this presentation here, but I really mean the same thing when I use either of the terms. So how do cannabinoids actually work in the body? So we actually have an endogenous system in the body. So we have receptors, um, there's signaling that goes on within the body, and uh, the body does release something called endocannabinoids. Um, so these, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, look a lot or mimic what cannabinoids are. Um, but when we consume or ingest external uh, cannabinoids uh, through marijuana, this actually ends up modulating the body or the system. Um, and so you can see here in this uh, kind of a, a nice schematic drawing of, you know, where does the cannabinoid or endocannabinoid system exist? It's pretty much everywhere. Um, you know, some of the, the major areas, of course, you know, within the brain, uh, the immune system, and I'll speak a little bit more about that. But essentially, the receptors exist all throughout the body on multiple different organs. The signaling occurs really through two major cannabinoid receptors. So by receptors, I mean these are kind of the, the, um, the things that detect the evidence of cannabinoids and it signals down through the biological system to turn something on or turn something off. And so we have here a uh, cannabinoid receptor type 1, so known as CB1. Um, and things I'll point out that are interesting about this is it's primarily found in the brain. Um, and when they've done studies on the CB1 receptor, essentially when they found activating this receptor actually sh was shown to reduce excitation. When we look at the second receptor, so this is CB2, uh, this is found primarily in immune cells. And again, activation of this receptor was shown to reduce the inflammatory response. So I think it's really from these two major um, findings that you know, people start to postulate and wonder, you know, does marijuana have any sort of benefit or role in ALS? Because you imagine in terms of what we do know about the causes or the pathophysiology behind ALS, um, there is an excitotoxicity. So you can see by activating the receptor, reducing excitation, you know, that might have a role. On top of that, it's also known that one of the reasons that you know, ALS progresses the way it is is there's this inflammatory response, uh, this autoimmune type of response that can come about. Um, and again, you know, the fact is activating this receptor has been shown to reduce the inflammatory response. So I think these are kind of the two big things that have pushed people towards saying, well, can we actually show that this works in patients with ALS? So of course the question is, well, is there a therapeutic role for marijuana in ALS? And I'd had, I mean, Dr. Moback has already kind of spoken a bit about this in terms of um, kind of looking, when we talk about therapy, there's kind of the two major categories. You know, we talk about disease modifying versus symptom management. So in terms of the disease modifying properties, these are things that basically alter the disease course. You know, things like slowing disease progression, improving survival expectancy. 
So these are the medications that he's already talked about, things like Rilizol, Adarivo, and Albrioza. But we have a very significant other arm to the treatment where it's actually symptom management because there are a lot of symptoms that our patients experience and we have to manage these too. Um, so things like cramping, spasticity, drooling, labile emotions, you know, the baclofens, the amitriptylines that we've prescribed, this is kind of the other major category. So I'll try to address these two categories of what we deem as kind of treatments. So question being, marijuana as a disease modifying treatment. So I don't think it'd be appropriate to kind of jump right to the studies without going back to where all this originated from. And really a lot of the studies with marijuana have been conducted on model organisms. So specifically, there is an ALS mouse model, uh, which we uh, term G93A-SOD1. And this is a common model that's been used to either test therapies or uh, to use as a, um, a model that you, know, you can uh, look at how you know, motor neurons can degenerate. Um, and so the way that they are testing these mouse models is a bit of a, a bio background here. Um, so one of the common things that uh, they use to test mice is something called a rota rod test. Um, so you can see here this, this mouse is kind of hanging onto this rod and essentially the rod is turning um, at all times and there's different rates with which this is turning. So the mouse tries very hard to kind of grab onto the rod and it'll kind of figure out how fast things are moving and it will move the same rate. Um, when the mouse falls off or flips over, um, that's considered kind of an end of you know, its ability to uh, cling on or its motor function. So this has been used quite a bit to you know, actually judge motor function. And so using that specifically, studies on this mouse model have demonstrated that cannabinoids um, have been able to delay disease progression as well as increase survival in mice. And so just to show you a little bit of this data, I apologize if it's difficult to see from some of the smaller screens, but um, you know, on, on the left side here, this is um, what we call the endurance time. So basically the amount of time the mouse can stay on that rod that's rotating. And this is uh, what we uh, deem as kind of age or days uh, after they're born. And what I really want to show here is um, there's kind of two sets here, this solid line, the rod's rotating pretty fast, 10 rotations um, uh, per minute. And then this over here is kind of a bit slower at uh, five uh, rotations per minute. But essentially um, what we see here with these numbers, zero, 10 and 20, that's actually the dose of marijuana or cannabinoids. And so when you see that at a higher dose, so here 20 versus zero, uh, essentially you have the mice able to maintain better endurance for a longer period of time at higher doses. And so this is shown either in the, in the faster moving rod and the slower moving rod. On top of that, you know, when they actually looked at the survival, they said, well, you know, are these mice surviving longer as well? So, this is one of our typical uh, survival uh, curves that's used in a lot of biological studies. Um, and on the left here, it basically shows you know, cumulative survival. So one being you know, every, everyone surviving, and then as we uh, get to zero, that's kind of when the, the population of mice um, uh, pass away. And so the big difference here is when we look at those that are on THC or the cannabinoids uh, versus those on vehicles. So this is just the, uh, the delivery um, compound, but no cannabinoids. Um, you see here that those mice with uh, THC on board uh, tend to survive a bit longer. So this is on the order of days for mice. Unfortunately, you know, as oftentimes a lot of the studies that happen in model organisms, uh, there really are no studies that have demonstrated a benefit of cannabinoids in patients with ALS. And this is not to say that negative studies have been published. Oftentimes when there is negative data, this might not, not actually get published at all. Um, but there's nothing that has come to the forefront in terms of a good trial where patients have, where, where uh, clinicians have said, well, we've tried cannabinoids in a nice randomized control trial, and these are the results. However, there is one active uh, clinical trial. It's based in uh, Gold Coast, Australia. And what they're actually looking at is uh, CBD oil versus placebo oil. And they are looking to see if CBD um, can change disease progression, uh, rate of uh, breathing decline, pain, spasticity, and quality of life. So this particular study is estimated to uh, complete in about January of next year. So hopefully we'll have some actual results from a, a 
fairly well-designed study from what I've read from their proposal so far. So how about the other side of that treatment arm? So, you know, we talk about symptom management here. And so what about marijuana as a therapy for symptom management? So one of the original studies that actually spawned a lot of kind of subsequent studies uh, was back in uh, 2003, where an online survey was put out uh, over a period of two months. And they had recruited members um, from this online community called uh, ALS Digest. Um, and patients were allowed to answer anonymously. And so they uh, gathered 131 responses and they made it clear when they started the survey, it wasn't about marijuana specifically. They wanted to essentially preclude people from coming in, especially those that are very pro-marijuana from messing up the survey per se. Um, and so people came in and they answered the survey and there were questions related to the use of cannabis. Um, you have to remember back in 2003, almost 20 years ago, the vast majority of places marijuana was not legal. And I think that's very important because um, nowadays it seems like, you know, on every street corner, you know, beside the liquor store, there's a marijuana store. But back then, you know, for people to use marijuana, oftentimes it was illegal. And you can imagine there would be some apprehension about actually filling in these surveys because you're not sure where this data is going to go. So in the end, uh, really only eight of those 131 responses uh, reported cannabis use in the last three months. And this is what they used to kind of build their survey. So the numbers are small. So take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. And so patients were asked to rate uh, the degree to which cannabis helped alleviate symptoms. And this is on a five point scale. And so this kind of summarizes those major symptoms. Um, so if we look here, kind of uh, the first part is the symptoms listed on the first column. The second column is the percent of people that reported relief. And I think it's important to also note that the number of actual responses. So we're not talking about hundreds of people responding and these are the numbers. We're talking about sometimes very small numbers, three or four people. But things to actually take note at the very least, you know, things like depression, appetite loss, pain, drooling, spasticity, and weakness tended to have at least percentages that were above the 50 uh, percentile. I would, however, caution and say, besides the small numbers, when we actually looked at the number of people that said, well, how long did this effect last? Usually it was on the order of hours after consuming cannabis. So it wasn't a, a long lasting effect where you take it once and it's like, hey, you know, I have this effect for, you know, weeks and weeks to come. So important to note that as well. So well, what about some high quality evidence? What else have been, has been out there? So there's actually a, a, a fairly nice study that was uh, conducted in Italy. Um, the name of the study was uh, Can Canals. Um, and they looked at marijuana in treating spasticity because marijuana has been shown in some other neurological conditions like MS to actually be pretty good in treating spasticity. And so they looked at this uh, oral spray called Sativex. So this is a combination of CBD and THC. Um, and this was a phase two trial. And so 59 patients uh, were on, they're already on their standard spasticity treatment. So this is people that are stable on things like, you know, baclofen, dantrolene, other things that we would suggest to help control spasticity as much as possible. And when they were stable, they were put into this study and they were randomized to either receiving the um, marijuana versus um, nothing. And so it's actually a very interesting study because they did it in two ways. And I apologize for kind of the small picture you guys are probably seeing here. But um, to show you, uh, they used a scale called the Modified Ashworth Scale. We actually use this in clinic as well. So um, sometimes when we're actually there grading the amount of spasticity that um, our patients are experiencing, we actually have a number based on a uh, particular criteria that we record in the chart. Um, but what they show is, if you look here, this first um, uh, column here would be the baseline. So at baseline, you know, those that are the red being placebo and the blue being those on cannabis, um, it, there's no difference. So statistically, they're pretty much the same in terms of that modified Ashworth scale on spasticity. And what they did was they did a double blinded uh, phase initially where they said, okay, now we're going to now randomize you to marijuana, no marijuana. And at the end of the double blind phase, when they re-examined those patients, they showed that there was a statistical difference in terms of those that took marijuana, meaning the spasticity actually got better, compared to those that are not on marijuana. But to kind of give it even more evidence, they said, well, now that we've 
unblinded. We're going to you know, do an open label phase. So this is where you basically say, okay, now we know, you know everyone, this is what we're giving you. So everyone ends up going on to this uh, marijuana. And you can see here, those that receive the placebo, they kind of return back to a level that's similar to those that have continued on the marijuana. So no statistical difference between the two. So kind of a neat study here. How about marijuana and treating cramping? So this was another um, uh, randomized uh, control trial. Again, double-blinded, meaning the, um, the patients and the uh, examiner didn't know what uh, they were receiving. Um, and it's a crossover trial, which I'll tell you a bit about because it's kind of neat. Um, but 27 patients, these people had daily cramping. Uh, they were treated with uh, THC, five milligrams twice a day, and then versus those that got nothing, so the placebo. Unfortunately, there really was no difference in cramp intensity, uh, the number of cramps or even in fasciculations, which was another thing they looked at. Um, and I think it was a pretty well designed study because what they did is for all the patients, they have something called a run-in. So they basically observe people for a period of time initially and say, okay, well, you know, what is your cramp intensity over this period? Then they receive the actual treatment, so the THC, and they say, okay, well, how much has that changed? And then for them to kind of say, well, let's see, is there kind of a placebo effect to this? They do a washout period first, and then they actually switch the group that received THC to then receive nothing, just to show that there isn't actually a placebo benefit here. And they do the opposite here in terms of running people getting placebo first, they get a washout, and then they receive the THC. So unfortunately, marijuana doesn't really show much in terms of treating cramping. So really to summarize all of this, um, Marijuana has been shown in motor neuron disease animal models to slow down disease progression and increase survival. Unfortunately, there really are no studies that demonstrate a similar effect in humans. Although, as I mentioned, there's one active one being conducted in Australia right now with anticipated completion in January of uh, next year. Um, patients from that small survey that I showed you did report improvement in various symptoms while taking marijuana, but albeit it was a very small survey, and I do have to point that out. Uh, rigorous clinical trials, unfortunately, are quite few. Um, there is a positive effect on spasticity, uh, but really no effect on cramping. So the bottom line is the choice to trial marijuana, I think, really is personal and should be considered based on the values of the patients. What I can say is that from all the studies that they have uh, put out so far, there is no significant toxicity. But that being said, there are still side effects that can come from marijuana. So with that, I'd like to thank you.